promise you guys I have a, a chance to, to talk uh, in a minute. We're going to break out. But if we could get back, onto the, back on schedule with the program, I'd really appreciate it. Can you hear me? Not very well? That's all we got. Thank you. Appreciate it. I've, I've also been instructed that we are, we are being um, streaming, I guess, on the webcast. And so we will try not to, we, we can't really deviate from the schedule anymore. So uh, we wanted to make sure that we gave you guys a break. Uh, but uh, from here on out, I think we're going to try and stick to, to the schedule as much as possible. So if you are one of our speakers, we, we appreciate uh, all the work and all the time that you've put into this. Uh, but uh, if you see us flashing a five-minute sign, please not to take offen uh, try not to take offense to that. We just want to make sure that we stay on schedule with the, with the, the media. And so what I'd like to do next, uh, because we are behind, is uh, I'd be remiss, though, if we didn't announce a few people that are here, though, uh, that have come in, uh, that are part of the initiative, that are part of this partnership. Let me get through my names here for a second. Uh, but I want to recognize uh, Tache, the Texas Association of Chicanos in Higher Education, Francisco, is here with us today. Uh, <laughs> Mari with Gentex. Uh, Mari, if you could, there she is. <laughs> uh, Audrey uh, from Advice Texas is here. Audrey. And I believe Isenia Bernal from the uh, San Antonio Hispanic Chamber. Yes, Senia. Yes, sorry. I have a daughter named Isenia, so yes, Senia. Uh, these individuals are part of a collaborative. Again, we've been talking about this diploma, so we're going to talk a lot more about that um, uh, tomorrow. But uh, uh, all of the, those that I've mentioned are partners in this initiative, along with the San Antonio Education Partnership, uh, the mayor's office. Uh, the community college district that we had, the Alamo Community College District, as well as UTSA and Texas A&M Kingsville, in addition to all the school districts that, that are here today. So all of you are partners with us in this. And I guess uh, just to sum up what we heard in all the presentations and focusing on the really good stuff that you guys are doing. And, uh, and I think that's really what we're trying to get done here is that how do we come together as a collective to help you move the needle. And much of what you talked about, uh, if you think about it, or not only what happens in the classroom, and how you prepare them, uh, your students, to be college ready, but also the, si the social, uh, social economic factors that occur before and after school and on weekends, and even some of the psychosocial factors that occur uh, as well. And so this is how the partnership uh, that exists in this diplomas uh, or exists to help you uh, to augment those kind of things you're doing, and we want to help, help you achieve those goals. And so we're going to talk a lot more about that um, the rest of the day and then again tomorrow. So without further ado, though, one of the major partners that we have is the Mayor, Mayor Costler's office, and representing Mayor Costler's office, uh, and I have the pleasure of working with daily, is uh, Gene Russell. So, Gene. So I have the best job here because I get to introduce um, Greg Darnito, who is a personal friend who I think so many of you in the room through either work on FAFSA or Gear Up, or just as a thought partner in thinking about how do we do this work around really setting ambitious goals in terms of connecting college access, enrollment, readiness, completion. And um, so uh, I just wanted to give you, those of you who don't know Greg, kind of a quick sketch about his personal background because I think it sort of ties everything we're trying to do here together. Greg has worked in this field for more years than he probably cares to count, um, but from a, a multi-perspective. So he's been a funder. He worked for many years in the Chicago public schools, really designing the same kind of frameworks and aggressive goals and then implementing them that we're talking about doing here today. And now he carries this message from the Department of Ed. So he's trying to hear from places like ourselves, so I'm sure he heard you, Dennis Ann, um, and take that back and figure out how can we do that systemically across our country. And, and mostly he lives out of a suitcase going to communities like ours, really helping us kind of think through this work. And so I'm, I'm really grateful for the work um, that Greg is doing and has done. I think we figured it's his sixth visit to San Antonio. So he's been a tremendous friend to our community. And I just um, want to welcome Greg. But before I bring Greg up, I quickly wanted to let people know we we had some people fill in the back that are some funders. This ties again to the work that Greg's going to talk about. This work we, is, is really your work, but we want to figure out how everyone in the community can be supportive of it, whether it's from the mayor's office, whether it's from the funding community, whether it's from our nonprofit partners who are also in the room. So that's, um, they said they just want to be flies on the wall. So don't, you know, I'm not going to announce them by name, but that's who's joined us in the back. So, Greg, take it away. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So I was looking to 
my notes on the plane ride yesterday up here and uh, uh, realized that my first trip to San Antonio was uh, just less than two and a half years ago. And Juan Sepulveda and Jose Rico and some folks from the National League of Cities. Um, we were part of the front end, I guess, of the San Antonio 2020 planning process. And for two days, I think we met with or some of you in our meeting, looking at close to 200 people apparently getting some ideas on the table and, and the book. And so I love coming back here. Um, we love, oh, thank you, Jean. Um, <laughs> oh, there you are. Thank you. Uh, she's trying to get me to buy a place here so I can have a third house kind of keep up with the presidential candidates. I guess. <laughs> One house, yeah. Oh, multiple homes. Um, but no, I just love, love coming here. And what I want to do is pick up on some of Jorge's uh, points and pick up on some of the points that were made by each of the districts here, um, somewhat connected to collective impact, somewhat connected to the importance of data and the such. Um, and you're going to hear from me again tomorrow. I literally have been only back in D.C. I think five days since Labor Day. You want me to use the microphone? And they're pleading with me. Okay. All right. Hey, hey, friends of Luminum. Okay. So, um, so this all started, you can blame me for your being in the room today to some extent, and, and then you can blame Jacob, um, and then I shared it with Roxanne and with Jean, uh, because last summer I went to St. Louis and TG put some funds in, and we brought, I think it was seven or eight school districts together for a two-day uh, college and career planning process. And some of the funders from St. Louis were actually the ones who organized this in terms of the, the mechanics of the day and the such, and TG put up some, of, some dollars to actually make it happen. But, um, and it, um, I have to confess, for those of you, some of you who've heard me speak before, that I do come to these conversations with a lot of biases around school counselors. School counselors, where are you in the room? Yes, okay. Um, one of the things that Jean did mention was that I started as a middle grades teacher, middle grades teachers, I know there's, and supervisors, some of you are in the room, right? Why are you being bashful when I came up? <laughs> okay, so, um, so I come with uh, th those biases. Um, I also come with a bi strong bias because of my Chicago work around the power of data. Um, Judy and I were in Milwaukee five or six weeks ago for the Strive Conference. Anybody else there for Strive? Couple others, okay. Um, and so this whole collective impact conversation and the power of that, when it's driven, and I say this because I experienced it under Arnie's leadership, in that case from a school district, and in Chicago's case, we had to bring Mayor Daly along. But in your case, you have a mayor that's really leading this. And for lots of different reasons, very powerful reasons, and as far as I'm concerned, that's where the most powerful work in the country is going on these days. It's when you have a mayor or a school superintendent, higher ed president, who actually get the power of the importance of education in terms of the economic future of their city, of their, of their communities and, and the such. And they're driving these conversations. But the St. Louis experience was really powerful because these, this was like, oh, it's not just working in um, district by district, it's actually districts coming together, and this, um, Patrick was referring to this earlier, in terms of we're in this together, right, as a, a San Antonio community and, and as such. And there's such power when we, get, um, we get to the, when we get to the point of actually concerted, coordinated efforts um, across the community. And, and tomorrow, um, when you see me again, I'll share some of uh, my stories from the road, if you will, um, in terms of some really powerful work, quite honestly, that's, that's happening in rural communities as powerfully as it is in, in many urban communities um, uh, across, across this country. But, um, and I'm really interested in just keep continuing to learn from you and to kind of see this process. So in less than two and a half years, at least, you know, my own experience was that initial two-day convening in July of 2010. There is this kind of this continued action has been happening, and it's and it's been happening in a coordinated way. 
it's not just happenstance. And there's um, people in this room that have been facilitating those conversations and, and the power of the possibility, if you will. Um, and many communities across this country don't have what you have here. Um, and many times it's, it's hard to appreciate what you have when you aren't able to compare it you know, to, to what's happening in other places. So um, congrats on last week's early childhood victory. That was huge. A few thumbs up there, there you go. Um, one, of the, one, of the, one of the consistent conversations I heard, particularly from school counselors in this 10 weeks that I've been on the road, uh, from rural America to urban America was how important it is to start seeding this kind of career and college message with their kindergarten students and their, and their first grade students. It was, and these were not orchestrated conversations, it just kept coming up um, in really interesting and creative ways. Um, and I'll share some of those e uh, examples uh, uh, tomorrow. But, um, so, um, anybody see 60 Minutes last Sunday? Okay, 60 minutes. Uh, the president's been talking that there are 3 million jobs available today, right now. Good paying jobs. So what does 60 minutes do? It does a, uh, a um, part of its show Sunday on advanced manufacturing. Because some of you heard me speak that there's, um, and Secretary Duncan has talked about this, the president talks about it, he tends to talk about much broader numbers that there's four to 500,000 advanced manufacturing jobs available today, right now, that are unfilled because of this mismatch between the labor force and expectations of business. So what does 60 Minutes do? They do a segment on advanced manufacturing opportunities. 500,000 jobs available today, folks, in the country. And where do they go to? Nevada. Highest unemployment rate in the country, right? And they find a manufacturer outside of Las Vegas who is desperately seeking employees. Willing to start them at 50 or $60,000 a year. Because what do they do? They, they make fasteners for the aerospace, the aerospace industry, right? Um, and they need people who can run machinery that's all computerized. That, because these fasteners have to be calibrated down to one one thousandth of an inch, if I remember correctly, right? Then they have to be able to verify that when a fastener comes out, that it meets those specs. So they need people who can do some math to be able to do this. And they're having trouble. They had 20 um, basically adults in this class training these men, I think it was all men, to, to run this machinery. Fascinating, it was like, Way to go, 60 minutes. Maybe we just need to put you on the DNC payroll here and <laughs> help us emphasize some of these points that we've been trying to make. Um, but this is, right, an issue of alignment between K-12 and higher ed and the workforce needs that exist. I used to hear this plea in Chicago from west side of Chicago in the city, small manufacturers when I was running CTE all the time. Greg, we, we're desperate for employees. Um, one of the points this segment did was it illustrated how a lot of their current workforce is going to be retiring. And they um, are either going to go out of business or they're going to transfer those jobs overseas. But these are good paying jobs available today. Three million of them. Another half million, 600,000 of them in the medical industry. Uh, drive down the highway. Almost every other semi seems to have a sign on the back, call 1-800-NEED-DRIVER, right? There's supposedly 200,000 truck driver, God bless you, jobs available across the country today. So anyways, the opportunities in many ways couldn't be greater um, as we kind of embrace this, this challenge. So what I want to do is kind of build off what I heard. Um, I was asked to kind of reflect, I guess, or comment on, on what I heard. So these are not meant to be criticisms in any way because you were given like 10 minutes to tell your story and, and then sit down <laughs> and, then we'll, and have conversations after I um, put the microphone down and, and figure out how to, to move your work to the next level. So these are not 
criticisms and they might be aspects of um, things that you're doing but you just didn't have time to mention and, and the such. So my first reflection is on middle grade. And my question back to you is, do you see most of the data we saw, and maybe this was because of the templates you were given to fill in and the such, was around high school. And Northside, Debbie mentioned some of the stuff they were doing actually going back to kindergarten that went beyond the academic in terms of the, you know, the holistic child, if you will, and the supports and the such, which I think is a critical dynamic here. Um, but one question I just put out there, how do you envision your strategies um, beyond high school? Now, let me just reflect on, on the challenge we had in Chicago. So we had about 15% of our students exceeding standard. And then we had 50 to 60% every year, kind of in that middle ground, um, who were meeting standards or just a little bit below meeting standards sort of thing. So it was like, how do we push this huge number of students forward in that meeting standards to exceeding standards? So what do we do on the academic side? What do we do on the college knowledge side? What do we do on the non-cognitive side, if you will? What do we do on the social emotional side and the such? Because I think it's gonna be really difficult if we just envision this challenge of getting, whether it's a San Antonio 2020 goal of 50% or Luminous 60% or however you envision it, how are you gonna move your data if you only envision it as, as a high school strategy? Um, and I think that's part of what I was referring to and talking about how this kind of constant, consistent conversation across the country of starting in pre-kindergarten, kindergarten becomes so critical um, and as such. So just, just one, one, one observation. I love the conversation when it comes to San Antonio about building systems because I don't know how we're gonna achieve any of these goals if we do it school by school, program by program, if we don't, if we don't view it as districts building systems, both internally and then with their community which is why I love the collective impact theory of change because it broadens the responsibility behind you as educational leaders to say, this is what Mayor Castro gets, right? This is our ch challenge as a community. It's the faith-based, it's the, it's the um, civic community, it's the higher ed community, it's the business community. This is our challenge as a city, as a, as a community. And so, um, but to do that, and really move and, and take advantage of the three million current jobs or the 24 million additional college grads that, that Lumina says we need. We're only arguing from the administration standpoint of needing 8.2 million additional post-secondary degree completions, completers, additional, above and beyond, right? <laughs> so there's this building of systems between you as um, district leaders and and your colleagues in other sectors. And this is hard. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen the recent College Board report survey on school counselors. If you haven't seen it, go to their site, download it. But one of the, and they interviewed, surveyed both school counselors and their principals. Because they were looking for alignment or disconnects in terms of does the mission of the district align with what school counselors experience in their day-to-day -day responsibilities? Or how much of a disjuncture is there? They wanted to know, to, for school counselors, do you feel you were adequately trained in your programs of study to get your master's in school counseling to do the job that you're doing? You know what that percentage is? Only 16% of school counselors in the country felt that their <coughs> master's program prepared them for their duties and responsibilities once they got hired. There's obviously a huge disconnect there. Um, we had some insight into that in that less than 10% of the master's programs in school counseling even offer a single course in college and career access, even one course. And there's only five or six universities in the entire country that offer a master's in school counseling slash college and career readiness. Only five or six um, 
Johns Hopkins has one. They graduate 18 or 20 students a year. Um, there's 110,000, I think, school counselors at the secondary level in the country. So we have a huge knowledge skill gap to achieve this goal when our, if we don't support our school counselors in really substantive and strategic ways going, going forward. Um, another challenge I put on, on the table, and this is where data comes in. So it was, when Jorge was um, talking, I was making some notes to myself about the grocery business, you know? So all I know about the grocery business is that I go to a grocery store two or three times a week on my way home from work, right? And so, but they hook me all the time, right? Because I'm a Coca-Cola addict. And <laughs> Ira too? Okay. <laughs> it's a southern thing, right? But I'm from the north. Anyway. Um, <laughs> but I know that Coke, because I'm addicted to like the 20-ounce ones, they are like, when I walk down the soda aisle, they're like at eye level, right? Coke is. They're not on the bottom shelf. Right? They're not on the top shelf. They're like right there. So the grocery business is, I assume, interested in total sales per day, per week, maybe by the hour. They are interested in the number of customers that come through their stores. They're interested in um, the average dollar that we spend, you know, maybe between 8 and 9 o'clock in the morning and between 11 and 1 in, you know, in the day or on the way home. So they're, those are kind of outcome measures, right? They're, they're related to their profitability and, and the such. But behind those numbers is another whole strategy in terms of placing that Coke at eye level so that I don't have to bend over and pick it up from the bottom shelf because there might be less of a possibility that I would do that. Um, they're interested in the labeling of the product to get, my atten to get our attention, <coughs> right? They're interested in and that's the label or the placement of the product is related to their, what they're really interested in measuring, the sales. But there's a strategy behind increasing those sales. And there's probably lots of negotiation between vendors in terms of who gets the eye level space and who gets the bottom shelf. And it just hit me that in terms of measuring high school graduation rates or <coughs> college enrollment rates, or ACT, you know, t test taking rates and the such. Those are all things that kind of are indicators at the end. But inside of getting and affecting those metrics are strategies, are a whole set of strategies. So let me um, reflect back on, because um, I don't see this much in education yet, but we're getting there. And that is the power of data analytics to not only understand and know what our trends are in graduation rates, ACT taking rates, and, and all of that. We need to understand that. But in order to affect those, as we know, there's a set of strategies. And I was a, um, Gene sent me uh, materials that you guys had presented in terms of resources available and as such. So there's a huge number of best practices going on across your districts, you know, your GO centers and your your uh, college advise advisors and having a place like Cafe College and you know um, doing collective types of activities across districts and celebrating whether it's national merit um, winners or it's it's um, faster completion or whatever it is. But behind all of that is a whole set of strategies that are either going to work or, or not work. And what I was interested in when I ran this work in Chicago was, yes, those outcome strategies, but I was as interested in students who were in career and technical ed by program of study who were also in AVID, who were also taking AP classes. When we started to analyze, you know, not just CTE as a Jorge made this point, not just as a broad number, that's interesting. I used, I used to call them curious points of interest. Oh, that's interesting, okay. <laughs> so what do you, you know. But we had a philosophy that if we were gonna measure anything and take the time to measure it, it also meant that we were gonna do something about it. Otherwise, why were we gonna measure it? 
Now, there are certain data that we have to measure for state and federal re requirements and the such, but beyond that, why are we measuring anything that we're, um, and producing, as Hari said, you know, endless volumes of information if we're not committed to doing something about it? Um, how about kids who are taking, what's the relationship between kids who are in AP? Okay, we had lots of examples. But how about AP and AVID? If your theory of change is, is just AP, well, you're going to have a set of strategies. But maybe there's additional insight if we start cross-referencing students who, and creating <coughs> smaller subgroups to understand what's, what's happening with them. How about kids in um, Upward Bound, where your uh, high school has a relationship with Trinity or one of the other colleges? or a talent search grant. How about, what are you learning, those of you have Gira, what are you learning from Gira that can affect your district, your high schools, when those funds go away? Um, a number of districts see Gira, because of its cohort, as the perfect research and development pot of money. Let's do with Gira funds, federal funds, a, um, a set of activities that we expect to have an impact on, but that we can leave behind in the district. Because if it's good for those, those cohort of gear up students, why wouldn't it be good for the students right behind them who might not be or have that, um, have that, have that opportunity? This is the type of question we're actually asking at the department, is what's the added value of federal investments 1.2 billion dollars a year in gear up and trio alone every year 1.2 billion in terms of the exact indicators that each of you presented what is what is that and there's a few districts that are beginning to get insight into into what is that added value um, my work in Chicago we had a data we had electronic attendance and grading system that allowed us to, to look into certain data points that researchers from around the country seem to be indicating were critical um, intervention points. So ninth grade on track, which I think Northside presented, became really, really important to us <coughs> because there was direct correlation between course <coughs> failure, first semester, freshman year of high school, and eventual high school graduation. So if we know that, and again, we had an electronic grading system, I had 110,000 kids across 120 high schools, so the only way to do this, literally overnight, producing color-coded charts by course, three weeks into the fall semester, back to the principal over the weekend so that Monday morning these were on his or her desk, knowing exactly which students and what and the number of students who are already failing algebra. So if you know that if that student continues and is already failing, continues a life, um, and doesn't <coughs> recover, why, why do we keep down that path if we have information that says let's intervene now and maybe we start that course over Maybe we double up on the course. Maybe we bring in, you know, tutors from the local university or whatever the dynamic resources available are. So if that becomes one of, and it, this is one of Jorge's points too that I really liked was, it was like we have to, and it's part of what collective impact's about, right? It's around, it's around dissolving these data points down to Q1, where you're because there's only so much time and energy any of you have and the teachers and principals under your direction have to impact any of this. So why don't we, if high school graduation is one of those key metrics, and we know ninth grade success, first semester is critical, if we know through Bob Balfant's research at Johns Hopkins that the ABCs, attendance, behavior, and core academics in middle grades is directly related to high school graduation, then why don't we organize internally our resources 
but also externally our resources. And I'd love to hear, some of you are involved with City Year. So, so City Year's been kind of saying that they're willing, as I understand it, to hold themselves accountable to you school leaders for impacting in those middle grades attendance, behavior, and academics. Um, some of you heard me share the example of Big Brothers, Big Sisters in St. Louis. They, they've gone to like seven or eight school superintendents and said the same thing. But what it does for those organizations is it, op it presents an opportunity because they're not experts in middle grades math. They're not experts in middle grades reading. They need your assistance to bring in your best math and English instructors or writing instructors to train their volunteers so that you've got an extra resource that's assisting the teachers. But if you've got a way to measure the kids who have a big brother, big sister, to calculate the added value of keeping kids or getting kids back on track in reading and math or whatever, I'm just using these, those as examples, that's a really powerful coalition. And you're seeing more and more and more of this <laughs> happening. So that it becomes this community, both internally within the district, but also externally with the broader community. Let me use FAFSA. Um, by the way, congratulations on a 40% increase in one year. That's unbelievable. Um, <laughs> I remember Roxanne saying to me, we're going to assign every senior to an adult, both in the, either in the building or in the community, right? And I'm going like, yes, that's right. <laughs> this is about a year ago. And, you know, um, and it's like, wow, I don't know any district in the country that's had that, that percentage increase in one year. Um, but it's taking that one data point and saying, we're going to make this a critical. Now, I bet one of the things you did, or I would suggest even strengthen it further, is wouldn't it be nice to be able to push back to the AP director, the CT director, the AVID director, how their students are doing on FAFSA completion on a regular basis, meaning weekly, so that it's not just the school counselor's responsibility to move that particular data point, but it's like I've got a team of people internally, and then I've got a, people, a group of people externally, you know, from the business community, from the faith-based community, or whatever your strength of your resources are, to actually reinforce what's happening inside the school so that they become our backup partners and the, one of the things I love about Collective Impact is that you, which doesn't get talked a lot about when I, um, when I hear it talked about, was this kind of reinforcing activities by multiple agents, multiple strategies on, on those data points. And it's really, really powerful because it's actually somewhat freeing, I would bet, so I'll hear your story, <laughs> from a counselor standpoint, to know that you're kind of in this role of directing this, right? You don't have to sit with 127 kids and help them fill out their FAFSA form, which is usually the first reaction a school counselor has, oh geez, you know, I don't have the time, when I'm gonna do the time. We're not asking you, we're asking you to, to bet on putting together a strategy that if you set it up this year, next year, it's gonna be 80% easier to implement. One, because you've got success that you've achieved that can be celebrated by everybody who helped achieve that success. And somebody had to drive that. And, my, and my, part of my bias around school counseling is that there's many of these college and career data points are there for the taking. They're there, FAST was there for the taking. If I'm a school principal and I decide that FAST is gonna be one of my key metrics to I'm not going to do that probably. I'll support it, but I'm going to probably turn to my school counseling team and say, hey, <coughs> I'm going to support you, but I need you to drive this. <coughs> who, else, who else are they going to talk or, or basically turn to for the most part? So anyway, um, am I out of time? I haven't gotten to five minutes the last year yet. <laughs> You're signing to me? <laughs> A little bit of time. All right. Um, so... Um, so let me just end with this point, going back to resources that you guys have been able to kind of pull together and, and there's a common theme and common message. Many times it's not a matter 
of getting more of those resources. It's using the resources that are right there in front of you in the most effective way. And it might be actually cutting back on some of those because you can't manage them effectively enough. And I say this from my own experience. Um, and, I, and I say it in that, in this, going back to this college board survey that they did of counselors and administrators, one of, the, one of the data points that came out of it was, we don't know how to do this community outreach. <coughs> it's not that we aren't willing to do it, we just haven't done it. It's not part of our DNA. We haven't been trained to do it. And, and so I think some of us who have been doing organizing type work, if you will, for part of our careers, this is just like common sense, right? Or just kind of comes with, oh, this is what you do. You pick up the phone and you, you know, you <laughs> make your, your plea or whatever. But I know when I started doing fundraising, when I ran nonprofit agencies, I was scared as stiff to pick up the phone and talk to a funder in terms of trying to <laughs> sell what I believed in because I just didn't know that community. I didn't have any knowledge of them. I didn't know how they thought. I didn't know how they, they you know, considered their, their decisions and the such. And so it was scary. It was really scary. And I think a lot of us in, in the education, whether you're an administrator or you're on the counseling side, can be a little intimidating. And so how do we kind of ease that? Um, I want to go back to the St. Louis convening, because one of the, the, the St. Louis funders who put that together realized that this was an issue for these seven school superintendents that they brought together and for their teams. And so the last two hours of the convening, they brought in 30 community leaders who each of those districts could have taken time to do some outreach, probably with a lot of trembling and, and fear, but they delivered these people right to the district leadership team. And after they did their planning, they had an opportunity to meet each of these 30 people and to make their case in terms of we need your help because we wanted, we decided that we we're gonna expand AP or we're gonna take more field trips with our students and we need money for buses or we need you know, help with FAFSA because we're gonna focus in on that. And it was this, so I'm anxious to hear, maybe Jacob, you've got some feedback, I haven't gotten it back yet, in terms of just, has that, what has that led to, right? So this kind of bridging of different communities, assuming that people know what to do with resources, but the reality is that they might just need a little mentoring and coaching and self-assurance building in order to make that connection and and, make, and take it to, the, to, to their advantage. So um, I'll leave with that, and do we have time for questions or five minutes? Um, and then you're gonna have to work with your teams, I think, so. But, and any questions? Let me just say, um, on, on this collective impact, the one of, at the conference, one of the topics that got up, that was brought up was was um, protecting the integrity of the model. <coughs> and part of this um, is beginning to break down because it's easy to kind of say, oh yeah, we're committed to data. Um, we're, we're committed to the transparency of data. But all of us know that that can be really scary. Um, some of you heard my story about going into Arnie with our first data, um, National Student Clearinghouse data. And it was just me and him and the head of strategic planning, <coughs> only the three of them. And the person who ran the data was the fourth person who knew what the report said. But Arnie had to make a really brave decision because our data was only 42.5% of graduates went on to, these are the graduates, went on, and half of the kids at that time were dropping out, went on to post-secondary. And we knew if, if we released it, it would be on the front page of the Tribune the next morning <coughs> in probably not a very complimentary way. Um, but he deliberated and made an instant decision to release the data, knowing we would take a huge hit the next morning, which ended up being 100 stick figures on the front page of the Tribune with six of them colored in, basically saying to Chicago's taxpayer, hey, guess what your investment of $10,000 a year per student for 12 years is yielding you, six college graduates. But 
So that was our truth, right? Um, what I've come to call our ruthlessly honest truth. It wasn't sugar-coated in any way. That was it. But behind that, Arnie had the confidence in his team that we would impact that number. And that number for eight years in a row has steadily gone up, leading to 4,000 more kids from last year's class in college than from <coughs> seven years ago using NSC data with the same number of high school graduates. A 47% increase in the number of, of students going on. But so these are not necessarily easy things to do, but courageous leadership driving it when you have the support of the mayor and others in your broader community is, couldn't be more significant and the opportunity couldn't be greater for our young people than it is today. Three million jobs available today. Um, your 2020 goal is tied to your this year's fifth graders. Right? Yeah. So, do you have the systems in place with your 10 year olds for the next eight years to achieve that outcome that you want to achieve? You have to build the system to make that happen. And if I've ever seen collaboration and the opportunity for deeply in collaboration anywhere in the country, it's, it's here. So I look forward to being with you for the next day and a half. Good to see all of you. If you've looked at your, uh, if you've looked at your schedules, you know that the, um, the tomorrow, uh, this convening will, will uh, adjourn tomorrow with the, a press conference for the mayor and, and, and everybody signing on to this collective impact. And I think you, know, you were talking about HEB and business principles. If we use marketing principles, how long, how many times have you heard the word collective impact this morning? You know, it's like we're just going to keep dropping it out there on you. And I started making a little nodal. You know what those wordles are? This is a nodal. You just kind of keep making notes. And a couple of things that have kept coming up over and over uh, are our collective impact and also FAFSA and financial aid. And again, congratulations to all y'all that are working on that on the FAFSA initiative. Uh, down the road, a couple of months from now, we're also going to bring together a, um, a convening of the colleges uh, so that they can also sit and discuss what kind of strategies they can do to, to be better at retaining a lot of the students because we know that there is definitely this pipeline, right, that we want to create this systemic, you know, K through or uh, pre-K through through 20 or through 16, depending on, on where you're sitting at that. And so we're not uh, oblivious to that. We know that that's important and that's coming. So um, that will, and then perhaps from there, we'll, we'll bring all of y'all together. And so uh, just real quick before we turn it over to, to Alma, is uh, I wanted to say that it, for those of us that have been in higher education and community outreach for, say, I don't know, the last 20 years, you know that there's always these shifts, right? There's, there used to be a real focus on pre-college characteristics of our students. You know, what, what were they coming in with? and kind of putting the responsibility on, you know, things that they brought in pre-college or pre-education into our school systems and how we worked with them from there. Then about 10 years ago, 12 years ago, that shifted to kind of institutional characteristics. Institutions started to become a little bit more aware of, okay, well, what do we do as an institution that then helps these students get through college? And now we're kind of going through this other shift, um, and, and some of us have been doing this a long time in different ways. And now it's kind of like this collective impact, this kind of kind of community, right? How do how does everybody kind of work together? And for so those of you that have been in grassroots for years, you probably think, well, this is nothing new. I, I would beg to differ slightly in the in the way that it's different in that we are using data to drive a lot of what we're doing, and the data doesn't only hold you. And I, again, applaud you as school districts because this is you know these are your your statistics, and it's so easy to be to take hits on this stuff. But the data not only holds you accountable as as um, as Greg was saying, but the data also holds us accountable. The community-based organizations, we get funded too. And we're asked to show our funders, hey, this is what we're doing with the money that you've invested in us to assist these school districts. And so we want to be better too at helping you. And so just again to reiterate this idea of collective impact and about all of us being able to go back to all of those that uh, hold the purse strings and saying, hey, this is what we're doing as a community to work together so that we're all accountable. And so what Lumina has done with this idea of co collective impact in terms of funding, it said, not asked us to answer the question of how are we doing or how are we achieving alone, 
but they've really asked us, how are you achieving together as a community? And that's really what, what this Diplomas Initiative is all about. So we'll continue to reiterate that as much as I can so that when you leave here and you get a phone call from me or an email down the road, you'll be, able to, you'll be willing to have lunch with me or, or coffee or so forth. We ready to turn over? All right. So now I'll turn over to Alma. Very good.